welcome to PCR 2023. And it's great today to be talking about the learnings from the CoreFlow Mocker 1 study. And to help you understand this technology and the study, I'm joined by two friends and colleagues, Mark, <coughs> Marco Valgimili from Cardio Ticino in Lugano and Rob Schwartz from Minneapolis. Hi, thank you both for joining me. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So I'm really excited about the late-breaking clinical trial of Mocha one but when I say that, people probably think I'm talking about a, a special type of coffee. So we're going to have to try and break it down to, for the audience. What is Mocha one What is the core flow technology? But most importantly, why is this important to their clinical practice? And today, what we'll be talking about is really microvascular occlusion. What microvascular occlusion is, why is it important in our practice as PCI, and can we do something to diagnose it and then manage it further? So Marco, I'm gonna start with you. When we think about STEMI care and what we've done in STEMI, there's been such amazing advances in how we treat a STEMI patient but there's still unmet clinical needs. What do you think is missing? Thank you, Azim, for asking this very important question. I think with stent availability and easiness of stent placing, the capability of interventional cardiologists to fix the culprit artery, mainly the epicardial vessel, has become quite straightforward and routine. We can get the job done easily. But what is frequently missing, not in all patients, but in a sizable proportion of patients, that we are failing to achieve a good microvascular perfusion. And we kept giving to that condition different names throughout the years. And geographically, we were speaking about slow flow when the TIMI was not really three, was sluggish, two, three, one, two. Then we call it no flow when you had TIMI zero. But then, of course, the availability of cardiac MRI has a bit opened our eyes and actually letting us understand that few days down the road, what we thought was a slow flow actually ended up in being completely failed microvascular perfusion. And that's where the terminology comes into play with microvascular obstruction, MVO. Okay, great. So MVO, still a very important unmet clinical need. But Rob, is this something we just talk about in meetings? I mean, is MVO just an MRI phenomenon? Or do you think the cardiology community needs to know about MVO and why? A great question, Azim. This is a critical thing to know. MVO is the most important finding in the STEMI patient in terms of prognosis, uh, heart failure, arrhythmias, the need for defibrillators, and so forth. It is the number one risk. It's better than ejection fraction, LV EDPs, uh, ventricular volumes. Uh, most, most cardiologists aren't aware of this, uh, what a critical finding this really is when it comes down to clinical outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if we think about many of the clinical studies we've done in STEMI in the past, none of them really looked at MVO, right, per se as the endpoint. We looked at TIMI flow and blush grade. Ejection fractions and, and frame counts. Frame counts, yes. exactly. Yeah. But that really isn't reflective of MVO, which is really the, where all of those surrogate markers were trying to evaluate, absolutely. So how do we diagnose MVO? Is it just, I mean, we, we, we tried in the past, looking at frame counts, looking at TIMI frame counts, looking at blush grades. Is there a way to diagnose MVO right now? What do you do in your cath lab? So in the cath lab, unfortunately, for the time being, we don't do anything with that respect. We get our PCI done, and then in a segment of patients, a fraction of patients, they would undergo MRI before discharge, ideally three to five days before discharge, and that is the moment where the diagnosis will come into play, a moment in which you have basically a missed therapeutic opportunity. You have the diagnosis. Rob already alluded to it. It's a great stratifier. We know that prognosis is independently associated with MVO, but at the end of the day, apart from risk stratifying the patient, there is not much you can do. In the cath lab, you would infer the presence or absence of MVO based on EKG, LA solution, how the TIMI is there. We have TIMI 3 and TIMI 3. If the patient has already relieving symptoms immediately afterwards, so whether the symptoms will continue over time, but in fact, you don't have a gold standard way of capturing it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what we've done in the past, right, is we've tried to keep it clinical, look at the EKG. If the EKG is not great, um, maybe there's MVO. But I, you know, I say to my fellows all the time, Rob, when you do put that stent in the stem and you have TIMI-3 flow, it doesn't mean the job's over. In fact, you're right. There's a 50 to 60% chance that MVO is still there even in the presence of TIMI-3 flow. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the problem, is that even when you have great TIMI-3 flow, Absolutely. you still have part of your microvasculature that's occluded. 
So, Marco, I mean, you said there's nothing in the cat lab, but I, I see all these papers talking about IMR, okay, that it's prognostic for STEMI patients, and IMR, in my simplistic mind, it's measuring the microvasculature, so it's measuring the degree of MVO. So why are we not doing IMR in the cath lab? Adrim, this is a great question. Actually, I did use IMR in STEMI patient, but I need to disclose only for research purposes. I, we know that there is some degree of correlation between IMR and MVO. Studies have shown that. Actually, we contributed to those studies, but in fact, IMR is not well standardized, and I will, uh, nobody is implementing that routinely. So we are not doing IMR outside the clinical studies. Oh. Also because we have no understanding about the specificity and sensitivity of that finding. We know that if that cutoff is above 25, there is a higher likelihood of having MVO, but we do not know what does it mean, which is basically the missing step here. Well, I, I've got to say, we have a very similar experience. We now have a system in the lab to do IMR, but if I were to tell my physicians who are struggling to do it during daytime, that when they're there at 3 o'clock in the morning, they need to try and do an IMR, yeah. um, <clears throat> I think, uh, yeah, they won't be very happy with me. Let's put it that way. That's probably, Rob, where the idea came from, right? You realized as a physician and an inventor that there was this unmet clinical need. There were, we were doing all these PCIs, yet you mentioned 50% you know, of patients with TEMI-3 flow may still have an infarct, an occluded area, and we have no great way of actually measuring is there microvascular occlusion. I'm assuming that's where the idea of core flow came from. So maybe if you could tell mm. us where the idea came from and what is this core flow technology? You're, you're exactly right, Asim. But the, the, just, you, there's no real significant indicator that we can conclusively say, as, as Marco alluded to here. The fact is we have a nice circuit, effectively. We have flow and we have pressure. That pressure-flow relationship must be disrupted when there is substantial obstruction downstream. Therefore, the idea for core flow came about that we can better characterize, in fact, exquisitely characterize the relationship between flow, which we now inject, rather than util utilizing anti-grade flow that's uh, a native. We block the native flow. We insert a computer-controlled flow. We know exactly what the flow is. We have a pressure wire downstream. We know exactly what the pressure is. And now we have a very firm relationship mathematically between the pressure and the flow, which is what the core flow is based on. We now have a much better way diagnosing distal downstream obstruction because the pressure flow relationship is, is markedly disturbed in the case that there's microvascular obstruction downstream. So before I ask Marco to tell us about the data, it goes back to my, my attending at, as a director of the lab who comes at 2 o'clock in the morning. Are they going to want to use core flow? Well, I think so. Uh, being an internationalist myself and Martin Rothman, who also was early involved, we, we have what we call the 2 a.m. test. If, just as you said, if an interventional cardiologist is not going to do this at 2 a.m., it's probably not a viable product because it's so critical that this be done really in all STEMIs. That we, we try to design a system that, in fact, is useful. It is an over-the-wire, uh, over I'm sorry, it's a uh, rapid exchange system, computer-controlled pump. A lot of the setup is automated. Marco has probably the most experience with that of anybody in the world, and uh, I think he can perhaps comment on that. But it was, it's a start, it's a first wave, and I think it's going to be an iterative process to make it as user-friendly as possible. I, I agree, honestly. It's a two-minute, actually, uh, measure. You just need to bring in the balloon on a pressure wire, commercial available pressure wire, and in less than two minutes you get the full diagnostic cycle done. So I think it's absolutely doable at whatever time frame in the day. And I'm not delaying my STEMI care, right? So <laughs> no need for vasodilators. So you do oh, it afterwards. Process. So yes. you need what you need to do. And afterwards, after stand placement, once you say, look, I'm pretty satisfied with the result, then you get your measure done, which was actually the selling point to all my patients to get into the study. I'm not doing something strange. I'm doing what I would have ever done, but at the end, I'm going to measure how successful I am being. And the patient always got into the study without any issues. Well, that's a great segue to the study. So yeah. tell us about the results of this first study, Marco. Thank you, Azim. MOCA-1 is a very exciting study. It's a first in human study where we have selected anterior MI patient, anterior STEMI patient, with the rationale for uh, the fact that anterior MI have much higher likelihood of MVO, so we want to have an enriched population with that respect. We will only select those who are early presenters within six hours uh, from symptom onset to, to door to balloon. Patient got treated in the way they would have anyhow been treated, and then at the end we did our measures. We included 38 patients, 
of whom 30 have complete data set. The study was quite complicated, especially for having them receiving MRI in the proper uh, time window. So we have 30 patients in whom the measures were complete. And the measure is, as Rob was already described before, we get in the stent with our coffee balloon. We measure pressure, systole, diastolic, coronary pressure before balloon inflation. After balloon inflation, we wait a few seconds to reach a steady state, and then we start infusion, a controlled flow rate of 5, 10, 20, and 30 ml per minute of Ringer's lactate. Ringers. Meanwhile, we are continuously measuring the pressure. pressure. And that gives us a very important parameter, which is the coffee pressure, which is the one which is most closely related to the presence or absence of MBO. What did we see? We ran a rock analysis and we saw that at 121.5 millimeter of mercury of that specific coffee derived parameter, we have actually sensitivity of 95, specificity of 91, and overall accuracy of 0.94, which is extremely high. If, if you look into the worst case scenario, you look at the 95% constant interval, taking into account that we only have 30 patients with complete measure, Still, the lower boundary are close to 80%, which is basically already a great diagnostic tool for having MVO assessed in a binary fashion in the cath lab. Mm. Actually, we have already preliminary data. The number of patients is still small, but still interesting preliminary data that you can even quantify the amount, the extent of MVO, as well as transmorality infarct size. So I think if confirmed in future studies, this is going to be a new diagnostic tool in primary PCI patient at the end of the procedure. Yeah, so just to confirm again, because I think this is really important for the audience, this is going to go beyond a red light, green light test, right, where it's just a yes, no answer. We'll be able to tell our colleagues in the future, not just that you do have microvascular obstruction, but the degree of microvascular obstruction how much infarct size potentially uh, they have, which could also then push forward for therapies. Absolutely. Any limitations of the device and the study that well, you want to mention? No, for the time being, I think the study was very easy to be done. Yeah. Uh, we have only very short inclusion time, which is roughly very well tolerated by patients who actually stayed with closed artery for hours. So after you make that open and you close it again very shortly, the patient are tolerating that approach very easily. Okay. It's something that you do at the end of the procedure when the patient is relaxed, when the team is relaxed. I think it's very doable. Okay, great. Rob, so you've obviously seen the data. Uh, it's very impressive. We finally have a, a tool that would be fits into the workflow and we'll pass the 2AM test. I like that, the 2AM test. Um, can you maybe talk about what do you think the impact of this data is and what are the next steps now? Well, I think it represents the very first time that we've been able to definitively diagnose with 92, 93% accuracy in the cath lab, at least in this case, microvascular obstruction present or not present. Now, as alluded to by Marco, we're currently working on getting the ability, what was it, 10% or 1% or whatever, the, the literature basically shows that even the presence or absence is a very useful clinical number. And yes, the amount, the 10%, the, the analog amount is, is useful, but it still is a major milestone to be able to at least know presence or absence in all the literature that says uh, the presence or absence is a very definitive uh, indication of prognosis. All right. Um, so hopefully it looks like we have a great tool to make the diagnosis. But, you know, we're interventional cardiologists, right? And we, all, we don't just want to make diagnosis. We want to make patients better and we want to do something. So is there a therapeutic part to this device that will be present in the future or is this just a diagnostic tool? Diagnosis is step one. Step two is definitely going to be therapeutic. We have some early, uh, early data on therapeutic that is uh, certainly not definitive. There are some positive signals that maybe there is a, at least a start. We're still working on that, but that's, uh, that is definitely in the, uh, in the radar, something we really want to get to, uh, working with our cl clinical sites and really understand basically how do we best treat MVO once we have in fact discovered it. Great. Marco, maybe you just add on to that. The, the therapy part is gonna be difficult. What do we do today? I mean, why is it so difficult to treat MVO today? And do you see any potential for how this device may help? Yes, I think there is a huge potential because we cannot diagnose MVO in the cath lab. 
we have a sense that maybe the patient has or does not have MVO, but we have no definitive tool to say this patient has MVO, therefore I should do something. The first step is to get the diagnosis proper and done. I think that is going to be soon accomplished by the device. I think that will open the door towards a new wave of studies and research. Do we have a specific treatment for MVO patients? The answer is absolutely no, because we never diagnosed them. And if we did, that was too late right. in, in the pipeline. So I think having that diagnosed in the cath lab will open a new research opportunities to better understand which treatment should be given in this patient. And I think MBO could be even be multifactorial. Probably we're going to have a specific treatment for a specific type of MBO, but that is a completely new horizon in front right. of us. Right. Ex excellent. We've talked a lot about MBO in STEMI, Rob. Any application for this outside of the st setting of STEMI? Well, certainly there's uh, indications of the, these days with uh, Inoka, Minoka, myocardial with no uh, evident uh, epicardial coronary disease or ischemia. The technique should have application there very strongly, uh, Zim, because again, we can characterize the microvasculature in a very precise mathematical way with this technology. We need to get enough patients, we need to do this, but certainly working with the, uh, the clinical community, there should in fact be uh, substantial differences uh, in our ability to diagnose, uh, used to be called syndrome X. Any, any of these, uh, these issues that in fact are clearly related to the microvasculature remain a very large clinical problem, but. Uh, essentially very difficult to diagnose and certainly very difficult to treat at present. Right, excellent. Well, listen, thank you both for being here. Um, I think, you know, having listened to you, and I hope the colleagues will take away from this as well, that we really need to change the way we think and our approach about STEMI patients. Uh, the thing of coming into the hospital, putting that stent in and just seeing TEMI-3 flow and epicardial revascularization is not enough. We've really, thanks to you and thanks to many others, we really have to change the attitude to, oh no, it's not just the epicardial vessel I see, but have I revascularized the myocardium, the microvasculature? So I hope if anything, we've helped to raise awareness on microvascular occlusion, and hopefully also by the core flow device that's allowing us to take an invasive direct measurement of microvascular occlusion that really fits in with the workflow and then some validation of it from the MOCA-1 study. So I think it's very exciting times, and I thank you both for being here with us today. Thank you, Azim. Pleasure to be here. Thank you.